Uh, thank you to uh, Comas for always inviting us to participate in the activities. And we think that uh, we learn more than we can give. So I think today is not a learning experience for us uh, from the university and also what we have done so far. And what I want to speak about today is uh, to address some of those aspects of the theme of the conference, unity and social cohesion in Malaysia, how to make it possible. In a few days' time, uh, the Institute of Ethnic Studies, uh, on the 8th of October, uh, 2007, we were uh, established by the Malaysian government. Uh, I can and it was the first institute uh, of such nature in the country, even though we know ethnic problems are issues that need a lot more attention than just simply uh, government policies. It has to be looked into uh, in detail, studied uh, comprehensively, but we never had that. So it took us 50 years to realize that we actually have ethnic problems. Yeah? So in a sense, it is interesting for us to, to realize that and then we begin to establish this institute. But it was not the institute that came first. It was uh, the government introduced a compulsory course to all students in public universities, uh, irrespective of what their disciplines are, whether in medicine, whether in engineering, whether in uh, law, they have to do a course called Ethnic Relations. And everyone has to sit for the course. Uh, it is a compulsory course. And, and I was requested to, uh, to prepare the module for, uh, for a 30,000 odd student that take the course every year. So now the public, uh, the private university has also introduced this course. So actually every year we have 100,000 students following this course all over the country. Now, you would say that what can two hours a week do? But apparently from the feedback we got from the student, they need that two hours to speak like what you have now for the whole day. For the first time they feel they can say what they want to say in the class. They can bring their little video camera their little telephone, smartphone to show different things. And it is quite interesting, the students themselves have taken up projects to actually learn about one another. For example, I've seen uh, short videos of uh, Muslim girls going to Hindu temples. I mean, this you can't imagine. It shouldn't happen, but it is happening where a lot of people don't really want to visit each other. Eh? So it is quite interesting how from this small two unit course a week. The whole new effort at encouraging what I call a conscientization process. Nothing more, nothing less. It is a time and a period where the student can write, can say, can express many things that they were not able to before. So this is the feedback that we have from the students from all over the country because we keep on monitoring the feedback. And one of the Consequence is that after that, they encourage us, or rather the government felt that now we should have an Institute of Ethnic Studies. So there's a little bit of history, what has happened uh, in relation to ethnic relations in Malaysia, because I would consider there is now a concern, a system for, for a systematic need to understand these issues, not simply being addressed in newspapers or in the social media. Some serious research has to be done. When we talk about people at the grassroots, who are these people? What data we have about these people at the grassroots? Except from reporters from newspapers. We are not sure because they are all edited by the editors, not even by the reporters. So we know how the censorship goes in this country. So in a way, we actually have no data what happens on the ground. But we pretend we have. So that's why rumor mongering, uh, stereotype, and, 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 and prejudices keep on uh, being, you know, being uh, like what we saw on the script. This is what we, we, we drum into us every day. Now, what we have done in our context was, we know 
when we were given the, the Institute of Ethnic Studies was given the task to continue the, uh, to, to, to start and continue research on the subject we were given two simple mandates number one to look and find out why do we have ethnic problems in this country and how do we resolve especially those that we have come across in a couple of times in in the last 20 30 years uh, 40 years so the challenge is to find out why it happened how do we resolve this but the other challenge which is a little bit more difficult i've thought how do you explain why we don't quarrel I mean, relative to other countries in the world, we, we listen every day with violent conflict. <coughs> Why isn't that happening in this country? That too we have to answer. We just can't answer the aspect of why we have conflict. But why we don't have conflict? Why do we prefer to keep quiet when we know things are, you know, things are difficult? We don't like each other. But still, <coughs> why don't we say that? Now, this is the two, these are the two difficult things that we have to do at an institute. So, what I'm trying to do is to, to explain to you some of what we have done and, and, and I think the most important thing that we have to do when we started the institute was to provide useful analytical tools. Because the main problem in our country is that we use the same razor blade to cut everything. I thought that's not good enough. And a lot of our friends thought that when we analyze things in this country, is we have to use equally sophisticated analytical tools to understand. Otherwise, how do we analyze this? I used to give uh, talks to police officers and non I asked a very simple question. What is the difference between seeing and observing? They can't differentiate between the two. And yet, it's very critical for us to know that basic principle. When you see, you don't evaluate, you just see. And you take note. But when you observe, you have already some sort of ideas in your head what these things are. And then when you observe, then you make judgment. You make analytical comments. So therefore, seeing and observation are two different things. We don't even know this basic thing. But I think these are the things that we have what I mean by analytical tool, to have to realize even in the simplest things that we observe and that we see, it could be two different things. So today, you see or you can observe what was shown on the stage. For me, I didn't see, I observed because I know what they have, what they have said and how often we hear these words. So in a way, a lot of the quiet response general is because we know if, if it is not there, if we just see for the first time, I'm sure a lot of people will laugh, a lot of people will feel, ah, what is this, you know? But I think all of us in this room were observing with some ideas already in our head. And this is what I mean. The most critical issue in Malaysia is for us, for the first time, to look analytically, very seriously, the different tools that we have. So. The most important thing we have to do is this. This is what we realized. We kept, Dr. Dennison was there, came over to see me one day and said, I lost my job. He said, you know, so can I stay here for three days? He said, stay here for three years. He said, yeah. So he has been with us for seven years now, really. Yeah? So this is an interesting event that we have in our world. And one of the important things that we realized was, there is this endless, endless demand for national unity. People don't stop talking about national unity, especially after 1969. So 45 years on, five, five year development plan, still unity, national unity hasn't arrived. So to this day, still talking, hoping, and dreaming about it. So where is this unity? This elusive national <coughs> unity. And I'm sure not only Malaysia, every other country in the world is seeking this uh, unity. So the question that we raised was, among ourselves and among the researchers in our series of uh, roundtable that we organized, including with Comas, if we don't have national unity after 45 years, what do we have? Don't tell me we don't have anything. Then we realized we don't even have a term, we don't have a word, we don't have a phrase.
to describe what has taken place in the last 40 years. None. It's quite interesting. We survived for 40 years without unity. So what do you survive on? What is that process? How do you, what do you call that 45 years of existence? You can tell me you have no name. You can have, tell me you have no label. You have every label of every politician in this country. You can provide one simple label for what we enjoyed for 45 years. So that was our first task, is to actually looking for this term to explain why. Because during that period, those interested, uh, just five minutes, those interested in this slide, you can always have, you can ask uh, general please. Yeah? For 45 years, we, do, we don't have a, a term, a word about what we are, what we have experienced in the last, say, since 1969. So the challenge for our institute was to look for one. Because we know during that period, whether this is just uh, nice words, whether you like President Bush or you like Obama, you notice in their speeches, they always mention Malaysia as a model Muslim country. You don't have to agree with that, because you don't vote in America anyway. So it doesn't matter. But why do they, why do they try to be nice to us? Is it because they are being nice to us? Or they like our islands or through Malaysia, through Asia? I don't think so. They have got speech writers. Speech writers who are better put together here. But I believe the speech writers must have gone to Brunton Island or somewhere. So we like Malaysia. Yeah? So, but the most important thing is, if Malaysia has been perceived as a model, rightly or wrongly, then there must be something that we can say about what our existence. And that's why we borrow this word. In sociology, they call it social cohesion. So, as you now, we don't have unity. We have only social cohesion. What is that anymore? So for me, from our study, just to share with you, after all, that's what we have been tasked with, to explain about ourselves. Before we can even suggest where to go, we must know. So for me, social cohesion is an example how the plural, fragmented, and diverse components of the society, overwhelmed by opposites and contradictions that we can hear, we can see, you walk outside there, you will see, have been able, through a continuous process of bargaining and negotiation, bargaining and negotiation, including haggling. Okay? So in if you go by taxis in Malaysia, on the door is listen. It's a meter taxi, no haggling. Haggling means bargain and negotiation, right? Yeah? But in a higher level of haggling. Okay? Now, consensus and compromise at every level and section of the society to rise above it all in a most mature manner. To embrace peace and reject any form of violence for long-term mutual survival. I think this is basically what we are doing. Individually, collectively, small collectives or larger collectives. Obviously, we have strange people among them. Like for example, now we look at Islamic uh, extremism. 1% or less than 1% of Islam Muslims are involved. 99% of effort from the West is on the 1%. Can you imagine? 1% Muslim that cause the problem, 99% effort from outside on the 1%. So they left the 99% Muslim happily. Peacefully, but not. They also create problem for them. I just came back. I think uh, 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 Mujahid just came back from Melbourne. We just know what happened in Melbourne the last one week. The whole newspaper is about Islam, and you know. So it's quite interesting for me how in this country is the same. One percent of the issue, one percent of group, in fact less than one percent actually drumming up all this racism in this country. And the 99 percent is being affected. But unlike the, Mus unlike the way the West or the superpower dealt with the Muslims, 99 percent of their effort and energy to deal with this one percent, in Malaysia, that effort is what is lacking. That effort. We tried, okay, the last effort that we had was to create the National Unity Consultative Council. Remember here? 
and we have the secretary person. So it is interesting. <coughs> and for me, that is what called bargaining and negotiation. We continuously find ways and means. How can we find this channel to talk? So we found one in the ethnic relations course, but for a particular age group. But how do you find a, 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 an attempt or create a space for people to talk? And now this conference is one of them. So we continuously have these conferences. Why do we do this? This is what I call the bargaining and negotiation in Malaysia. We are unhappy, we say what we are unhappy about. You are unhappy that you hear this? Well, keep it and try not to do it next time. So continuously, we are telling ourselves. So when I try to, when people ask me, I'm sure many Malaysians will be asked this question, especially government officers. <coughs> When they go overseas, they will be asked, what is the formula of Malaysia's success? Because they see all these problems all over the world, and Malaysia is, you know, just talk conflict, but walk cohesion. We talk about conflict. But when they come to the real issue, no, we don't want to quarrel. We don't, violence is not an option. So they talk conflict, but they walk cohesion. In most time, this is the interesting part. So I always ask, so therefore, social cohesion is not unity. It is a path, a precondition to that unity. And I think this is what Malaysia has achieved in the last 45 years. But I think this is not good enough. To know is not good enough. But it's better than not knowing. So now at least everyone in this room knows that. For 45 years, we don't have unity. What do we have? Social cohesion. What is that social cohesion? That's what I'm trying to explain. These difficulties, these differences, despite of the fragmentation, diversity, opposites, contradiction, we're still able to find a way to deal with it. This is what I call, unfortunately, we have an act, a parliamentary act on innovation. It did not include social innovation. It includes only business innovation. Because in a multi-ethnic society, this is where social innovation is very rich. People will find means and ways to solve problems because they can't report every little thing to the government. The government has no time for that. You select an MP, after that he will leave, you don't see him for the next five years. So you don't see that. So therefore, uh, sorry my MB, uh, my MB. So for me, it's really very important for us to take things in our hand in a peaceful manner. This is why I believe we, we bargain, and, you know, today you hear in the newspaper, for example, or yesterday, or I have my son for flat, why is it not getting a place in medical school? In, in two weeks time, he'll get a place. So it's interesting, you have to actually raise this. Make this known, and then people will come and try to address the issue. But I had an interesting uh, comparison done by a friend. My friend is in the uh, University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. He's an economist. So he wrote this article called Economic Development and Political Conflict, Comparative Study of Sri Lanka and Malaysia. And from the data that he presented in the paper, I managed to draw this diagram, extract. It's not may not be a perfect diagram, but what he wants to show is there is social conflict in Sri Lanka, but what happens in Malaysia is not social conflict, it's social cohesion. Of course you have conflict, but non-violent conflict, as opposed to the violent conflict in Sri Lanka which cost 150,000 lives or more. So this is what he was trying to tell me. When I, you know, I trust economists better than political scientists, so I took that <coughs> example. So it's quite interesting when we argue, and he's a, he, he, he comes here very often to try to look at how, how can we work together and solve and find ways and means in Sri Lanka because uh, there are a couple of students from Sri Lanka are working with us also. So it is quite interesting because this comparative perspective is necessary for us to sometimes to remind us that we are in this situation but that's not good enough. Doesn't mean that by having this good comparison that we are now in social cohesion, Sri Lanka in social conflict, therefore we ought to be happy and do nothing. I, I don't think that is the main aim of what he's trying to say. He's trying to say, you have something good there, how do you maintain that? How do you sustain that? That is the challenge. 
And how do you do that? Where are you going after this? In Sri Lanka, they are busy trying to, like in, 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 in South Africa, they have their courts, confession and so on. They have particular system that they have developed to allow people to be conscious of what has happened and how do, how do they come to term with this trauma that they have gone through. So it is interesting for me and for us also to continuously see ourselves against others rather than just within ourselves. So then it gives us some idea where we are. But it doesn't mean we just stop there. And this is what the Institute thinks. So we talk about unity. Is unity the complete idealistic resolution we seek? For me, we are we are told every time unity in diversity, unity in diversity. So unity is only one side of the equation. The other side of the equation, like supply and demand, is diversity. So you may want to stress on unity, but we are talking about unity in diversity in Malaysia. So that the diversity aspect has to be addressed. For me, diversity in Malaysia represents the struggle for convergence or agree to agree. That's what we do. So what do we do? There's a positive element of diversity. We even have a Ministry of Culture and Tourism celebrating our diversity. We are so proud with Malaysia truly Asia slogan. Because we spend billions of dollars how to show how good our food is. <laughs> warna warna, the colorful Malaysia. We spend millions and millions to celebrate the positive element of diversity. But we also know when we talk about Allah, then we are talking about negative element of diversity. Because diversity f create fear, <coughs> create problem, create differences. We have to resolve that. But the government spent two million on this issue. There is the budget for National Unity Consultative Council. Two million. Mr. Ho, two million, yeah? But they spent 20 million for the education plan. Now, if you see purely in government budget terms, what is more important, the 20 or the 2? Obviously, it's the 20. But then, what is the 2? National unity, diversity, the negative element. So this is where I think we don't do what we speak, what we don't do what we claim. And that's why, in many ways, we have to invest, not only in money, but also other things, we have to invest to ensure this negative element of diversity doesn't become the issue and the problem that can rock all the nice dancers and warna warni and the, the rest of the thing that we do. So this is the, the imbalance that we have in this country. We celebrate diversity at the same time, in the same breath, we worry about diversity. We spend more money on celebrating. We don't even want to know why we have problems. What problems are created by the diversity? And that is why we have a third element in diversity called illusory element of diversity. Satu Malaysia. It's an illusion. We create this because we hope this will happen. Wawasan, dua puluh dua puluh. We should now become wawasan lima puluh dua puluh. Or whatever, tiga puluh dua puluh. We don't know. Because we have to have this. People say it's slogan, but for me, in a country like Malaysia, we need to have something, even how illusory it is. So in one way, I, you can tell me that I'm criticizing it, but in some way, this is what psychologists tell you. They promise the good, happy, you know, uh, that's light at the end of the tunnel. These are all the promises that has been to be helped out, which is necessary for the psychic unity of the society, so to speak. So I think, these three elements inform the whole notion of diversity. And we live in that diversity. In one breath, we breathe these three elements. We are positive. I have a friend who's in the travel agent. He's a rich guy because he believes in Malaysia, truly Asia. <laughs> but he's also the guy who's so afraid that uh, what happened to our country, man, what happened to our children. So I said, how much your profit you actually invest in some local? Very interesting. He observes 
the social innovation of Malaysia like a mama shop is a center of social unity. I said, yeah, I never thought of that. Because everyone goes to mama shop, they got everything there. They, there are heated debates there. I wish I could put a microphone and tape the recorder on each table. <laughs> and they will say that all the nasty things about everybody else around the world. And then they, and when Manchester United scores the goal, they stop for a while and shout and then they go eat the right? and then lift up the hand. Mama, one more roti. roti <laughs> the mama is happy. <laughs> now, nobody ever imagined a mama shop is actually a center for social cohesion. So ordinary, so common, but so real and important for us. We never thought of that. So next time you visit Mama Shop, go and order 10 roti channel. And start rubbishing everybody around. It's okay. That is the place. Yeah? So it is interesting. Social innovation in Malaysia is incredibly important. But it's sadly not looked as a venue, an element that we could explore in the way we look at Malaysia. So if we can schematize this thing. Unity in one side, you have unity, cohesion, reconciliation, and diversity. There's a positive, there's a negative, there's an illusory notion in diversity. This is what all of us are confronting. All of us are looking, you like it or not, we know all these words. There's nothing that we don't know here. Unity, everyone knows unity even before they are born. So in a way, now we know there's no unity, we have cohesion. And cohesion is an incomplete situation that we have. There are issues that we have to deal with. Why? Because there's positive element, there's a negative element, and there's illusory element. So what do we do? And we know that when we have cohesion, it's an incomplete. There are a lot of things that we are looking in terms of contradictions. Yeah? So, these are the major sort of contradictions in this country where everyone has an opinion about this. We officially or even popularly, we express, whether in the social media or anywhere, issues related to ethnicity, religion, social class, education, language, the generation differences, gender, space, and politics and governance. These are elements that we have gathered from all the RTD that we did the round table discussion we did uh, with uh, Dr. Dennison was organizing it from here we extract all these uh, ideas and issues that people thought what are the source of contradictions in this so what I'm, trying sh what I'm trying to say is when we look back at cohesion it is an incomplete situation because of the contradiction so we need reconciliation. What is that reconciliation? Not between MCA and DAP. That is not the reconciliation we are talking about. That's one other form of reconciliation. But the reconciliation we are talking about, how do we solve if there is an ethnic problem that relates to particular, particular group, particular schools or areas, how do we deal with that? The same thing with religion, the word Allah. How do we deal with that? And in Malaysia, class differences seem to be not important. For me, it's very important, class differences. In many ways, we are still talking about the bottom 40. So when you go above the bottom 40, you go up, you go to the middle 40. So what do you do? So you don't go up and up. So you just go one ring it over the line, you are no more in the bottom 40. But you are still suffering like the bottom 40. So what do you do? So that is the beauty of the poverty line. You cross it, you are not poor anymore. But are you? This is the question we ask. So the same thing with education and language. So there is a struggle in language. We struggle about English or Malay or whatever we want to speak in this country. We continue to talk about education. Oh, we did one school for everybody. And this will continue. Because the structure in this country is a vernacular school system with plural education system. You can't change that. If you can't change, then what do you do? Do we create more schools so that we can be separated, like create more international schools? You know, so that more people will be separated from other people in this country? 
So that's our choice. We vote people for election, they win and they decide and then they agree to what you want. So we, so in some ways, we may be complaining about a lot of things in this country and some of it actually we are responsible too. So we just can't point our finger of government or opposition. Because now the government has two meaning. Opposition government or ruling party government. So you have to be very clear which government you are talking about. Because they all got problems. Huh? They got to move here, move there, everywhere move. So, in many ways, I think we have to make that move. Right? So, what is the way forward in a way? This, uh, they, they, they have been thinking this in, in various methods. Right? We, in the institute, we develop a particular instrument. We, a particular instrument, we call it Monitoring of Ethnic Relation System, MESRA. MESRA KITA. KITA is the Institute of Ethnic Studies. And we have done a lot of work in 20 odd different uh, parliamentary constituencies, limited by funds because people don't want to invest in social research because there's no return. They want to invest only in ROI in social research is zilch, zero. Yeah? So they don't believe. They talk about unity, that's why so little investment in the negative element of social unit, uh, of diversity because there's no return. Or if there is a return, it can be seen. So therefore, we thought that the issue here is how to sustain social cohesion in the hope we can arrive at national unity. I think that is the one that we must bear in mind all the time. Solve the contradiction through peaceful bargaining and negotiation. Violence isn't an option. i tell you why. We did some work among workers in the Klang Valley. So we chat. What do they do from the time they wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning and when they go to bed at 11 or 1 o'clock at night? They come out, they struggle on the, on the highway to come to Kuala Lumpur to work in their offices and, 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 and also factories and whatever. So what do they do? They will leave all their differences at the door. Like they leave their shoes. Huh? They leave at the door, they go in, they work. There's an aim at the end. I must get my salary because I've got one, two, three budget, two kindergarten, one middle school. So, the, we are obsessed with this, with what I call social mobility. We are driven by social mobility. We want to be better. We want our children to be better. So for that, we are willing to perhaps suppress, perhaps don't talk, probably don't even think about the ethnic differences, at least for the eight hours. So I will call. For eight hours, we postpone our differences. That could be also a good... Something that we never considered this as important in our life in Malaysia. We postpone it. Of course, after five o'clock, a few will go to the MCA office, AMNO office, DFP office. That's what their job is. That's how they get their money from. But the rest, they want to go home because there is a Korean sitcom waiting. <laughs> that they have to see. At 8 o'clock, there's American Idol, must not miss. And by 11 o'clock, when can they speak about, I don't like that Chinese guy, or I don't like that Indian guy. There's no time. So actually, at that level, from our research, they hardly talk or think, unless being reminded by their young government. Politician who can remind them, we must remain, Malay must be united. So I think uh, it's quite interesting that the general public doesn't think the same way. But then why do they vote the same people? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Malaysian contradiction. They don't like what the politicians say, but they vote them again. <laughs> and for me, opposition or government, they are Pepsi and Coca-Cola, no difference. <laughs> so, our life has been a struggle of deciding, do we have Coca-Cola tonight or Pepsi-Cola? In India, they have Red Cola. Huh? <laughs> so it is interesting for me to see these events in our lives in front of us. So, what do we enjoy in Malaysia? We may not enjoy unity, as I said, but we enjoy what I call moments of unity. So we actually live between moments and moments of unity. From one moment to another. I remember, I live in Sraman. Eh? It's one of the most civilized towns. <laughs> uh, 
because they don't build new houses in the town, outside the town. It's interesting. I remember Lin Dan and Chong Wei was fighting for the gold medal in the Olympics. Saraman was empty. I said, where are these people? They either at home or they're hanging around all these uh, higher purchase shops showing all these big TV screens. And everything is there. For two hours, we forgot everything. This is what I call moments of unity. We have this, many of them. Nicole David and all this stuff. So, moments to moments, we leave this. And we think, and usually it will, then after that, that moment, then you go to the mama moment, because they will discuss this at the mama shop. So they continue this moment. And I think, at the phenomenological level, at the level of everyday life, this is what we do. Live that moment for moment and enjoy. Of course, there are moments of disagreement, moments of unhappiness. And then suddenly, when MH17 happened, everyone, I can see in the social media, very few want to see anything negative, because they get clobbered by everybody else. Huh? Uh, where do we fly there? Where do we fly the other way? They don't all even know how they fly. They want to say, this is a bird or whatever. So it's interesting in the social media when an issue that could be addressed I mean, people don't make fun of this issue, don't make jokes of this issue. So I think it's interesting to see these moments in unity. And I believe Malaysians do live in these moments. And they, 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 and they, are, they are nostalgic of this moment, and they talk about this moment. They talk about the concierge, they talk about open house. Wherever they go in the world, when they ask, they are asked, how could Malaysia survive with all these differences? We in Germany can't even survive. We only need the Turkish to play football for us. We can't, we can't give them citizenship, you know? So it's interesting. Why? So we only tell stories of the moments of that unity. That's what we have. We carry this. We carry these moments and memories of unity. And that's what we tell people. And the first thing that we tell people is about food in Malaysia. That's why now I have a research team called Ethnicity and Food in Malaysia. Because food is very important in the way we address, create the image of ourselves. And we have fusion food. In Malaysia, there's no original food, all fusion. That's why Indonesia finds it very difficult to claim us whether we are, our satay is better or not. Because our satay has been Malay ice, Chinese ice, Indian ice, everything. So I think we still can fight for the satay position. <laughs> and Nasi Lama, of course, can't beat huh? Malaysia. Huh? So, so uh, in a way, we also have this challenge of inclusion. In an ethnically diverse society, inclusion for me is a much desired objective like unity. Something that you dream of. But you know very well, the other side of unity is diversity. So you have, so you want inclusion in a diversity context, that is the challenge that we have to face. It is possible to try. I suggested somewhere else in a conference on history historian in Malaysia. We have to teach a new history based on social history where everyone's role is recognized. In this country, no. Ours is still the old history that we uh, the heritage of colonialism in Malaysia, which is a history of the heroes and villains, winners and losers. That's why we see all those little bust and, 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 and statue everywhere. These are all the heroes. I mean, they all look the same to me. The only difference is the name underneath. But the rest, they all look the same. Now, that history has made us, have given us a lot of pain for a simple reason. We have to decide who are winners and losers before we write the history. There was a time when, in my, when I was in the primary school, Makila was a loser. He was a villain. When I arrived at the university, he was a hero already. <laughs> in less than 13 years, he became a hero. Why? My teacher in a primary school is different. My lecturer in the university is different. They are group, different group of people who have different version of history. They, they twist the story around. So, but, if we make our history a social history, not a history of heroes and villains, then everybody has a role. You don't tell me that people who are building the railways or doing the tin mine are not heroes, but it's not included. In fact, gangsters are more respected. 
and their quarrel will be registered as important. Gangsters who fought, who are villains, villains who fought. Scientists, don't you think scientists are important too? Tell me in your history book, name of scientists. I think if there is to tell Daryl, and Daryl will give you five ringgit present. <laughs> right. I mean, that's how we are. So, I did mention in the history conference, they made a mistake calling me to speak on the history conference. So I told them they are teaching history that is not helpful to this country. So, probably in the next 25 years, they will never invite anthropologists to speak on history again. But I sincerely feel that we, we don't have to allow my auntie to stop teaching history. Because I, I still get, I, 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 I've got an A for my history in the old history. So I, I don't want to say that this is not good. But what we can do is to actually teach this new history. Not called history, but Malaysian studies. Because that's where we can speak of everybody's contribution. In a way it is about Malaysia. Everybody is contributing. What's wrong? And I managed to introduce this program in the university at UPSI, University Perguruan, Sultan Idris, where you can get a degree in Malaysian studies. Why? Because when I was teaching the course on ethnic relations, I knew if the course in the university is ethnic relations, what they have to teach in the schools is Malaysian studies. Where are the teachers? The teachers are ready. So we have to think that way. So if we introduce Malaysian studies with a curriculum, that includes everybody. That is the first small step to begin to think and talk of inclusion. Not about scholarship. Not about the first step is for everyone to feel they have a role in this country. But if that is not there, then it won't work. So finally, sorry, I'm looking at his watch. So said, Please stop. I said, yeah, right. I think unity is desired, but we achieve social cohesion. Many contradictions still, and we have to deal with this. And efforts and reconciliation must continue. I know it's going to be the way forward, it'll be how to make it possible. It'll be a boring exercise, but actually we have lived this boring exercise for 45 years, because that seems to be the only way we can live that, that we enjoy. Eh? So the challenge of diversity with many faces is inclusion as nebulous as unity. This is the, the debate that we have. Thank you very much. Saya sangat tertarik dengan apa yang Prof bertakan tadi. Saya percaya bahawa ruang itu amat perlu untuk membicarakan soal unity di negara kita. Tapi saya agak bimbang dengan keadaan negara yang saya rasa saya, bagi saya lah sebagai rakyat biasa Saya rasa macam kita semakin Kesempitan ruang sebenarnya sebab Macam baru-baru ini ada akta hasutan Dan sebagainya jadi macam nak Benda ini harus dibincangkan tapi Nak bincang itu Seperti satu yang amat suka sebab Semakin susah terlalu banyak Tekanan-tekanan uh, yang uh, Yang yang sedang Mengekang kita sekarang so bagaimana Kita uh, uh, Pada pendapat terlalu bagaimana kita uh, boleh mengatasi keadaan ini Maksudnya kita nak bincang Tapi bagaimana nak mengatasi masalah tekanan Tekanan yang diberi Supaya kita seolah-olah tak perlu membincang perkara ini Okey, terima kasih Tija I will take one more question from Tan Sri yes, Findings To what extent do you think your findings have made any impact On the mindset of the government? Thank you Thank you uh, Negara uh, he has been working very hard with his friends and we have been thinking and thinking so we were fortunate to be consulted to be asked and we gave our own 10 cents worth and it's now realized only 2 million worth <laughs> not like the 20 million worth and about the first question the answer untuk so so soalan itu saya rasa dia dalam dalam konteks Malaysia ini ada dua atau tiga level yang kita kena uh, pertimbangkan Apa yang saya cuba huraikan tadi ialah uh, satu gambaran yang lebih makro Memang tidak mencecah isu-isu tepat dan spesifik Tetapi kepada saya dalam institut kajian etnik Hal-hal makro ini perlu kita tangani dahulu Misalnya 
Sama penting dengan isu-isu yang uh, sudah disebutkan tadi Kerana kita terlalu banyak Terlalu lama Berenang di lautan dan kita tidak tahu di mana tepinya Jadi apa yang cuba dilakukan oleh institut ialah Menanda anas ah, Ini tepi dia ah, Ini dia dalam air ini Jadi itu yang kita cuba lakukan Tetapi kita cuba tidak lupa Dengan penyelidikan kita mengenai uh, Monitoring ethnic relation Kita dapat, kita tanya Misalnya soalan-soalan yang spesifik When was the last time you had dinner with a, a friend who is not Malay or Malay or Chinese or India? I mean, very mundane question. And you'll be surprised the answer. Because this is not a politician's answer. It's everybody's answer. So everybody's answer, yes. Saya tidak hari makan dengan kentin dengan dia. So, this is a different picture that you get. So, jadi oleh kerana itu, gambaran yang uh, yang bahawa kita sukar untuk memberi pandangan dan sebagainya ini dari satu segi betul tapi dari satu segi kalau orang itu mempunyai uh, kemampuan uh, menggunakan sosial media banyak perkara yang tak boleh disebut disebut sampai saya nak jadi uh, political asylum dekat Amerika pun boleh sebut tak ada masalah nah, jadi uh, there are certain traditional element or ways of expressing that has become very difficult for us kita anggap itu makin tidak ada ISA, tidak apa ni, uh, printing act dan sebagainya Maka ini boleh dilaksanakan Ini adalah harapan Tapi kita tak boleh kecewa kerana kita kena cuba juga Dan saya rasa saya mengalami daripada student di UM Sampai sekarang yeah, Demonstrasi dan sebagainya They have a lot more space now than yesterday saya ingat lagi saya ditanya oleh satu wartawan dari Wall Street Journal mengenai kes Azmi Azmi Syarum ya Dia tanya saya, he asked me uh, She asked me actually uh, What do you think about academic freedom in Malaysia? So my answer, I said, I'm not answer this question, I will tell you what I went through I have a supervisor named Syed Hussein Ali Who was jailed for six years under ISA without trial I can't talk about academic freedom I can only talk about how, how people has gone For various reasons have been put under detention camp You are asking me about sedition Sedition is about 10, 10 steps below of ISE That is the life that I went through So, I'm not saying academic freedom is not important But there are some realities in Malaysia That you have to balance in order to see One is more important or the other Unfortunately, our history is not written that way So very little we know about what happened to academic life Because AUKU They all want to change AUKU only for the student But not for the academic staff The academic staff still will face uh, punishment if you write without permission from the vice chancellor Can you imagine how many hundred years I have to be in a jail? <laughs> I, I wrote too much So it's interesting So, but the public don't see this. The public see only the students. Student. But student is so impermanent. Three years, they are gone. Then come another, another batch. That's why we never had a good choir in the university because they can't sing. Every time we got new singer, we have to teach them. So this is the experience that I have personally had. So it's interesting. We fear a very temporary group of people called the student. And we don't care about the permanent one called lecturers. So this is uh, another way of looking at academic freedom. See, so thank, thank you. you, Prof. Uh, can we have the next set of? Actually, I, I just want to respond to uh, Professor's uh, 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 statements just now. Uh, when you say you, when you actually say about uh, the uh, the uh, the other uh, the outside world perceive of Malaysia, you know, it's a, as a very as an example of a Muslim country. First of all, I like to correct you: we are not a Muslim country. Uh, uh, we are actually. <laughs> well, yes, but uh, they may think because they don't live here, so they think that it is actually a, a very. Uh, Um, an example of a Muslim country, but if they live here, maybe they, they will have a different perception. Um, and about your statement about the 99% and 1%, uh, 1% Muslims, you said, that uh, are extremists. But I, I disagree with you. This 1% is causing a lot of problems. 
okay and they are actually uh, uh, portraying what Islam is and, and because of that and in this country particularly the government endorsed these extremist views and I, I, I believe that you know somehow or other uh, these extremists are actually affecting uh, everybody's lives so it is very important the government look into this so uh, I disagree that you actually say oh 99% most of us no we are not living nicely at the moment we are not um, okay, why why there is still no fighting in Malaysia? And I say it's because thank God for the non for the cafes, huh? for their sensible mind for not actually fighting the Malays. Although despite uh, the angst and despite the provocation made by a lot of these extremist Malays, the the, the non Malays have been very very uh, strong and very uh, what shall I say? I mean. I respect them, you know, they are, they are very tolerant, they are very, they accept whatever being thrown to them. You see, the worst thing about this country is because the government endorse, you know, the endorsement by the government, by this behaviour, by behaviour that we should not accept in a, in a tolerant, in a multi-ethnic uh, country. Um, and, you know, my solution is, Professor, if you are in a position to suggest to the government, is to overhaul our education system. Why we are in this situation now is because our children, they have been taught in a certain way, and a, a view of Islam in a certain way. So they come out to have one, point, one view of Islam, and that is the extremist view. And I had my daughter in school where she's not wearing tudung, and the uh, Ustazah actually say all the one wearing tudung are her children. The one not wearing tudung, they are all going to hell. So these are the type of teachers that we have in school. So really, if you are in a position to suggest to the government, overhaul everything. You know, I mean, uh, I have my nieces and nephews not allowed to go to the non malays houses. So is this actually encouraging uh, uh, multi-ethnicity uh, or living together as friends? When I'm small, there is no such thing. Okay, I actually go for uh, to church. Uh, to uh, to sing with my Christian friends, no problem. My mother didn't say, "Oh, you become a Christian." Nothing like that, you know. But this is a problem, really. Uh, I think it's the way our children have been educated, as well as the teachers. And I know that for for sure, it's a confirmed thing because, for example, like UIA, they are teaching extremist view, you know, and and these are confirmed by the UIA students. Uh, if the, 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 the if the lecturers are of a good uh, you know like more liberal view, they will kick the lecturers out. So they keep uh, people like Shambrahayu and all that lot, uh, you know, to keep this uh, view about. Uh, so I really uh, so, so sorry. I just I feel very strongly about this. So please, professor, if you have uh, you are in a position to suggest, you need to overhaul our education system. City gets very for Malaysia to be uh, to be progressive forward for unity, I think we should have the, we should include the inclusiveness among the uh, the people that in Malaysia. So one good example is that, that if Malaysia need to be a, a becoming a so-called kind to be a one Malaysia, then we have uh, problems in the East Malaysia because uh, uh, we have no identity. For the moment, yeah? because wherever we go, I think the privileges are not with us because we are regarded as limelight. So I believe that uh, for uh, for Professor, I, I need that to be put on board uh, on your proposal if you want to really to match uh, unity for Malaysia for the Thank you. So thank you. So they categorize us like the way they categorize trees you know they have latin name for everything you hit the grass is called something else you touch something is called uh, zurio zebitinos durian no? <laughs> so the naming system we are talking about is it has become part and parcel of our life we are defined see people talk about divide and rule i talk about define and rule because you cannot divide anything before you define it so i think all these history books have to be rewritten because we are not talking about divide and rule. We are talking define and rule. Who defines? That is very important. And I think this is 
also the issue of education in Malaysia. Who defines education in Malaysia? And how do they define this and rule us according to that definition? Now, identity in Malaysia is very much fragmented according to the definition given by a census. Once every 10 years, we are defined. In 1871, when it was first introduced, there was no Malay, Chinese, Indian. It's always 37 linguistic groups in among the Malays, 15 among the Chinese, and so many else among the Indians. You go and check in 1871 when they start the straight settlement census. Then they found it a bit difficult. Huh? They have to reduce that. So, some, banyak, some. so reduce to three. Malay, Chinese, Indian, and there's a basket called others. What cannot fit, they go to others. Now, come Sarawak and Sabah. Sino Kadazan, Sino Iban. What do you do? So I think these are the issues that are very detailed but also very macro in the same time. How do you decide? So, I sometimes I work with the census department. I'm trying to tell them that uh, Tiger Wood has got seven ethnicities, I think. From being an Afro-American to a, a sweet Thai person. Hmm? So there's Tiger Woods. So why can't we have in Malaysia, there's so many Tiger Woods here, you know? Or thinking they are Tiger Woods. So I think the issue here is, uh, that's the same thing, the issue of IC, yeah? Uh, Islam and Malay and all this. These are issues that is, uh, that are related to the way we, we, the evolution in the way we define ourselves in this country. I mean, if you look at the definition of Malay, in the constitution, there is not the ultimate definition. If you want to have Malay reservation uh, land in Johor or in Perlis, the definition of Malay is quite different. The definition of Malay in Perlis, that includes uh, Orang Siam. But it doesn't include that in Negeri Milan, sorry. In Johor, Arabs are not Malays. That's why they cannot get scholarship. So, this detail we don't see, we only go 160 and part 2, you know, we only think, but the moment we go on the ground, state by state, then we see the first Malay uh, reservation enactment 1913 has defined who is a Malay according to ownership and who they are then at the, at the time. So this is, this are interesting diversity in the way we define ourselves. That's why we can never find that Malaysian identity. Why? Continuously being redefined by reality that we have. Back to question number one. That is more important, I think. Yeah? Well, I think I find it very difficult to disagree in many points. Eh? Because I also learned how to sing in the church. <laughs> but I can guarantee you I'm a very successful one. Because I ended up singing for a band in Malaysia. <laughs> and that band was number one band in the country. I know you don't know this band. <laughs> but what I'm saying is quite simply that there was a period in this country where those boundaries are not important. You see, what we are looking at is shifting boundaries, shifting boundaries of ethnicity. And how the boundaries become a capital, ethnic capital for groups of people to gain power. And this is important for us to understand. These shifting boundaries, we are caught in the shifted, these, these boundaries are shifting all the time. This is what I call the shifting boundaries, is redefinition of who is who, including the redefinition of electoral boundary. From uh, Malay dominated seats to Chinese dominated seats to mixed seats. These are all also redefinition of who we are as voters. So I think uh, while we want to express our unhappiness and suffering as a result of these consequences, we keep on voting the same people. Why can't we vote somebody who can change this? This is what my question to people who have this uh, opinion. Because I think, is it because we, we are, I mean I remember during those days uh, the uh, signature campaign for uh, anti-human right, you know, human right. Uh, so one of my answers to the to the to the campaigner, can you include there that uh, I as Muslim can become non-Muslim? That is my right. Oh, cannot touch that one. <laughs> so I said, that is my right. If I want to become a non-Muslim, why can I be a non-Muslim? Oh, the Constitution says this. Then that should be considered 
as violating my rights. Mm. Oh, we can't fight that. Then I cannot join you, I said. <laughs> so, I never joined the Human Rights Association. <laughs> and Davison is the boss. Okay? So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll have one more round. Boss. <laughs> I'd like to make two comments. Last month, rubbish in my housing area was not collected for more than one week. And so I decided to make an online complaint to the Kajang Municipal Council. And in there, I put my name, Ong Pui Liu, and then it says there, Bangsa. So Bangsa is Melayu, China, India, Line Line. I decided to put Line Line, although my name is very obvious, it's Chinese. But Line Line because I'm a Baba. So by definition, I'm a Chinese officially, but every day defined, I don't consider myself a pure Chinese. So if municipal of uh, Kajang uh, will, come, will come and say, why is it that you don't say that you're a Chinese, it's because I'm not a Chinese per se. But my, my question is, why should they put these definitions there? I'm going to complain about Sampa. Is it that if I'm a Chinese, if I say I'm a Chinese, they won't come and collect? The perception does not escape. Uh, yeah. Number two is that the back to city's question about um, Education. Yeah, everybody is saying education is a problem. If if uh, doctor can say that he introduced mission studies in C, why not we introduce a course for all teachers? You know, not just how to teach content, but how to teach in a multicultural society. Because our our classroom is is made up of uh, a priority of people, not just people from different cultural groups, but people with different learning disabilities, learning capabilities. So teaching in the multicultural context and teaching in a multi-ability context. I think that is very important in our teaching colleges as well as in our universities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Thank you very much, Dr. Shamsul. Again, I think you won us over with uh, your thoughtful insights. And um, I, I agree completely with you. We need to rethink and reconceptualize our relationships with each other. But I think while we are trying to say what the government should do, what our MPs should do, what everyone else should do. I think we need to consider as individuals, members of civil society, I think at no other period of Malaysian history do we have that kind of empowerment that we have today to make a difference. And I think that's what perhaps, for me, that's my take home message. That is my, my conversation with my children at home, my four children. My conversation with the children at home, if they come home with a complaint, and I completely understand what Siti was saying earlier, is how can we respond? Yes, yes, there's a lot of injustice, but how are you responding to it? Are you going to wait for someone of a higher of a position to address your problem, or are you as an individual going to make a difference? So I think, for me, my take home, honestly, after listening to you today, is really in, within my circle of influence, as an individual, how can I contribute positively towards making a change? Instead of waiting for some new policy to come up, because I tell you, I have so many people who say, oh, now why do you stay on in this country? Why do you stay on when, when you are considered a second-class citizen? Then I say, I refuse to leave. I believe in hope. I believe that I have faith in society. I have faith in what I can do as an individual to make that change. So I think we need to maybe consider respond and not reacting in more, more often than not. Yeah, thank you. You have raised is basically, uh, we also have to look at our own role. Okay, this is what I, I also emphasize in many of my talks because I think there's so much you can do. I mean, I always rubbish the politician for good reason. Eh? Uh, because we both once in five years, we, we believe and we trust them and then we, they left us and they do whatever they like. So what do we do in the next five years before they come back and we can vote again? So this is why the mushrooming of NGOs and all this is because of that. Also, not because, just because people like to have associations. That is also very important. But because they have issues which are not really addressed. So now if you keep pointing your fingers to the government, now we have to point two fingers. BN government and non-BN government. So government, government, government. So both of them are doing the same thing. They don't change anything. So I think the role of the individual is very important. I think Ong, I'm sorry, you have to leave in summer now. <laughs> okay, uh, we have one more question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Professor. I'm Isan from Project Dialog. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm really fascinated with your uh, saying that Malaysia is basically uh, moments, which for me is something quite a new idea, which not just that, looking into that, I start to realize that it's not just about Malaysia, it's moments. 
But the continuous progress of Malaysia is a continuous sense of momentization. We see this kind of uh, setup is continually being revised, and every time there's a uh, Independence Day celebration, okay, the process of creating new moments, new understanding. But at the end of the day, what is actually the main critical issues, the main point of Malaysia, which for me the way I see it is going back to the contradictory points. You put inside there the elements of ethnics, you, you put inside the elements of uh, religion uh, and politics. I think that's overall that's quite nine the main important elements. Which in all these nine points, this is actually where Malaysia, I would put it as, is something like not represented because that is all the division points and these are all the critical points to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in that aspect, maybe uh, I'm not talking about people on the streets or other people or people who are already in Utusan or who are already in Malaysia Kini. Even for us here, maybe, we, in certain ways, have our own particular interest in all those particular parts. And we are the people who are actually talking about national unity. Can we resolve all those points? I believe if we come up with one workshop, it may not be resolved. And looking into the more critical side, which I see most, is on the aspect of religion. Could it actually be something possible that religion is something which we can resolve the issue? Or we should actually be admit the fact that no, we will never resolve the issue of problems related to religion. It's not just because of the nature of human beings, we may have our own views of understanding of religion, but it is also part of the structure and institution of the country. If to challenge, we are challenging the constitution, we are challenging, there's a lot of things, it becomes very too complicated. So in making to get to one point, is that Malaysia is actually the cohesive factor. It's not something that everyone will really be close to, it's not a thing that everyone loves the country so much, but the, co the main cohesive factor is, it's Malaysia itself, it's not something which at the end of the day we talk about okay, when Lee Chong Wei is playing badminton, we have Nico David but whether it's that really the most important thing of being Malaysian or being someone being part of a nation but yes, we, ad we admit in the sense that okay, the existence of Malaysia is just to manage the differences it's not so much being too close to a point of to declare that we need to have some strong sense of unity Thank you Thanks Why Prof say that uh, people seem to see that Malaysia is a Islamic country, based on my experience teaching 10 years to the student from one race actually. Although I said that based on the constitution that Malaysia is a democratic country with Islam as the official country to the peninsula only, but they still want to translate that as an Islamic country. Why this happened, I think this, uh, this is because of the media. The journalists also take it for granted, not only uh, the lecturers, sometimes the journalists also take it for granted and take it very easily. And many times our Prime Minister also has stated in his speech that this is an Islamic country. So therefore, I believe that that's why the others are having this perception, although we are staying here. <coughs> Secondly, uh, I understand Prof, uh, um, uh, very diverse background on uh, race, even myself, uh, brought up in the Malay, uh, Malay's environment, so I do know Islam sometimes better than Malay's friend. And sometimes we attend a conference or whatever, so we do say sometimes uh, Assalamu alaikum, and I don't get respond, and they get offended. Okay, it's just a piece upon you. So this is sharing about everyday life, and also I would like to ask Prof opinion as an academic. Uh, we are encouraged to write. So based on my students' experience also, I decided to write one article on sensitive issue in Malaysia. It was accepted by a journal, Journal Belia. Then before printing, they rejected my paper. They say it's too sensitive. So is it our Malaysian people as a, is it our Malaysian people, the reader cannot digest? And based on the book, Hubungan Ethnic, Prof has stated that Malaysia are very matured enough to not to involve in any conflict. Comment please. Thank you, Prof. Good morning. I'm <coughs> Anwar from UNICEF. Um, the composition of our society in Malaysia is changing. Uh, what Professor mentioned, what well, used to be Malay, Chinese, Indian, then line line. If you look into the uh, census of 2010, um, now we have the actual population chart. Malay, Chinese, Indian, foreign nationals, then line line. So the, the foreign nationals, migrants, uh, legal or illegal, uh, document or not, stateless, or, the, or um, people coming to work in, in this country, um, is a fact. Um, refugees have been here since 1970s and they are still here. So how, how does this 
change in the Malaysian composition um, feature in the work. Um, if, if you want, we are talking about unity, we are talking about social cohesion, and also I will include peace building um, in the country. Thank you. Okay, my name is Isabella dari pada Aswara Akademi Seni Budaya Warisan dan Kebangsaan. Not a question from, uh, it's more of a comment. I nampak macam pelajar music, pelajar tari, they are more relaxed for lack of a better word. So like you just said, you know, you learn singing choir in a church. Budak-budak saya dia orang kalau orang Cina main alat gamelan, no hand. I got many a uh, wonderful Edna. He play uh, she plays uh, the Ahu beautifully, um, almost at a semi pro level. So tangtu mungkin um, dance, of course. You see Ramli, uh, the Ramli Ip, Ramli Ibrahim. Uh, he dances, uh, and then the examples go on. Mungkin that could be bukanlah solution, tetapi satu cara untuk nak mengatasi bukan mengatasi pun, um, you know. Thank you. Uh, research cluster called uh, ethnicity and integrity, uh, kesenian dan integrasi social. Because we believe kesenian has already played that role even before we ever imagine. Yeah? Yeah, so it's always there. And music is music. Yeah? Uh, they, uh, I know we can call Chinese music, Indian music, but I can see a lot of Malay dancing to Indian music all the time, uh, memorizing all the lyrics. Anyway, at least me when I was small. Huh? But it's interesting for me how. It's not so much we don't exploit this, we do this. Uh, but there are also divisions and difficulties because art is never free from ideological uh, uh, influences too. So there is another level of conflict that art can bring about in this country. Uh, as you remember, this word ABU became a problem when this new artist put it on the painting and then the painting was withdrawn. So that is my response to your question about self-censorship. Yeah? It's a self-censorship. A lot of things that happen in this country like Belia. Belia is definitely a magazine that belongs to the government uh, Ministry of Belia. I don't, want, I don't think KJ wants to raise this issue because someone will pick it and then will raise it. If not within Abno, it will be outside Abno. So it's still he has to answer. So I have seen uh, I mean including what I wrote I have been pulled out many times. Huh? Uh, you have been once, so I have been some of the things that I wrote for the masyarakat 10 years ago was pulled out three or four times for a reason that, oh, ini tak sesuai untuk negara kita. Uh, I said, okay, I translated into English and published in Singapore, it came out. So, you still have got hope. Huh? You don't, don't worry about Malaysia. You cannot publish here, you write in English. Singapore is waiting, they got two pages on Malaysia. The only country in the world has got two pages on Malaysia in the newspaper. So, always welcome. If you don't know the editor, you tell me, I'll send it to you. <laughs> it's very interesting. So, and then about this demography, invoke this idea of moments of unity. We are invoking this nostalgia memories. That's what it is. And true, we work like a ruby cube, but we never get the color all together all the same time. Thank you. Okay, thank